Right, thanks everyone for joining us uh, for this week's Super Facility demo. Um, we're holding this series of demos at noon on Wednesdays throughout May and the first week of June, uh, really to show off some of the tools uh, and the capabilities we've been de developing as part of the Super Facility project in the past uh, uh, year and a half almost it is now. Uh, so the Super Facility project, for those of you unfamiliar with it, um, is uh, designed to uh, help support uh, experimental scientists who need to use high performance uh, network and computing um, and it's a collaboration um, of, of people um, in uh, CRD, in uh, ESNet and at NERSC um, at Berkeley Lab. Um, so there have been two uh, demos already in the series. Um, the first one um, was around sense, um, which is uh, networking capabilities. And the second one was showing off some data management tools and data manipulation tools at NERSC. Um, and uh, today we have a demo of the uh, Super Facility API. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to our presenters for today, uh, Corey, Gabor, and Bjorn. Hi there. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so uh, I wanted to just give um, some appreciation to the other speakers here. Um, and actually, Gabor, if you want to share the presentation slides. So we have, um, so Gabor, uh, who's, who's sharing there, is the developer of the API. Um, and so he's going to give the demo and talk about some of the technical detail there and then also speaking is Bjorn Enders, who's one of our uh, science engagement leads within the Super Facility Project, and uh, so he helps us, um, you know, basically liaise with uh, scientific projects and um, and determine needs and requirements and things like that. And his input has been really instrumental in developing this API. And my name is Corey Snavely, and I'm the lead for the Infrastructure Services Group at NERSC, where the development of the API is, uh, is centered. We've got some plants in the audience, too. Um, Mark Day is also a member of, um, of ISG, along with Gabor, um, and has been working on some of the authentication-related components that fit with the API um, as a primary part of his role. Here. And then also Roland Thomas, who is uh, engaged with a number of other scientific projects and is also helping us understand needs and, and requirements uh, as well. And as in addition to having a depth of experience with uh, workflow development and a lot of cosmology projects. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. I'm just going to kind of give a brief introduction of of what it led us to develop a uh, functionality like this. And um, then we'll talk through a couple of use cases. Uh, Bjorn will talk about that. And, um, and then Gabor will give the demo. And then we hope to leave ample time for um, questions that you may have. Um, and we'd also kind of like to hear whether there are people in the audience who feel like um, they would need some different functionality. Um, from what we already have planned. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. So uh, if you've attended some of the super facility talks or, or heard uh, any nurse talk about supporting experimental observational facilities, you may have seen this slide before. And uh, this reflects some workflow analysis that we did of the kind of projects that we support that illustrated a growing trend towards supporting um, these sort of projects that span across experimental and observation facilities and a compute facility like NERS. And the reason this is significant with the API is that um, through our engagement with these projects, we've learned they have a lot of common needs around automation and data flow and, um, and complex workflows that have that really kind of drove us to recognize that there's an additional set of functionality that we need to build um, to help these projects succeed um, with the unique kind of requirements that that they have and so um, it 
when we took a deeper look into these projects and their needs and established some liaisons into some of the representative projects, and you see they're across uh, a variety of science disciplines here, we started to tease out some specific um, kind of building block needs uh, with regard to uh, how these projects operate that were sort of common uh, across them. And so if you slip to the next slide there, Cor, <clears throat> this is kind of a summary of the, the types of work and some of the characteristics of these experimental and observational um, projects that we that we drew out of our uh, engagement and um, and sort of generalized across these uh, the different needs and um, so you may have seen some reference to some of these this is um, this is sort of the umbrella of what we consider to be the super facility so I won't go through this in detail but you can see the, the common threads here and they may relate to projects that you're working on yourself so you know a focus on being able to work with uh, the scheduler actively to place future reservations and to have some notion of resiliency for continuous workflows software defined networking if you talk if you came to the sense talk um, previously, uh, you got some detailed information about what we have in mind for automation, automation around networking. <clears throat> also, data movement and just visibility into data, uh, and that includes the, the dashboard that's, that's been uh, developed, as well as uh, some of the functionality with around HDF5 as sort of a, uh, sort of a best practice for um, a very highly functional data format. <clears throat> uh, next week at this time slot, I'll be talking about the SPIN containers as a service platform, and that fits in as a place to run services that can sort of sit outside HPC but complement that, that and workflows. And then, the, and then what we're talking about today is API, the API and federated identity. And what we really see this as is a kind of a piece of glue that helps all of the functionality that we envision, all of the interaction with, with NERSC that these workflows need be done in an automated way. Uh, so that's really our vision. And if you switch to the next slide there. So how do we project uh, folks using the, the API as part of their project? So one of the big the big use cases that's common across all of the projects we've talked to is facilitating unattended operation, minimizing a, a human in the loop for projects, either because they need to move rapidly or because the volume of, of different atomic operations, like the number of jobs, for example, to submit and track is just too high to realistically handle. Uh, there is also the notion of building more intelligence into uh, real-time processes such as adjusting job parameters and having that stuff run in an automated fashion by uh, scripts, workflow managers, um, because there just isn't time in a lot of cases, as we'll discuss, to, um, to make those kinds of adjustments um, or to handle failures that um, happen maybe at 3 a.m. <clears throat> so really, Anywhere automation makes sense is where the super facility API fits in. And, and that's what we have as our vision. So when we talk a little bit about the particular um, capabilities that we've prototyped, sort of the scope of function for the API, um, you'll see that we've just, we've started with some simple primitives. And like I said at the beginning, we'd be interested to hear where it meets um, requirements and, and where it doesn't. So we can be thinking about functionality to introduce in the future. Um, <clears throat> so here are the actual endpoints and the API that we have prototyped. Uh, and so um, if anyone here is familiar with the first iteration of API called Newt, at NERSC, some of these are inherited from Newt and have some compatibility in their call interface. And some of the capabilities are new and uh, were brought about by the Superfacility 
um, project and the planning and the um, and the our science project engagements there. So I'll let you read the the um, the endpoints there. So we do a, a, um, we can retrieve accounting information. Um, there are some authentication endpoints to actually initiate the API session, and um, and I'll talk a little bit about the authentication model that we have in place. There are callbacks. There's a capability to register callbacks for asynchronous operations or situations where uh, something needs to complete and, and call back to a workflow manager in order to continue an operation. Um, methods for dealing with files, uploads, downloads, checking the health of the center or the resources at the center so you can know whether to fire a workflow off or wait or plan around scheduled maintenance. Mm -hmm. Of course, interaction with the scheduler under the jobs endpoint uh, and data transfers um, between tiers at NERSC or also via Globus. And then also the idea of um, scheduling future reservations, which is uh, often through very manual means right now. So that's kind of the, uh, the full scope of the endpoints we have currently prototyped. And we're gonna show some of them during the demo. Um, next slide, please. So here is um, kind of a colorful and busy diagram that tries to show the authentication and access model. So one of the things that we wanna do uh, with the API is embrace modern design patterns for code so that we sort of meet developers uh, where they are in terms of implementation. And so this is a, a reconceived authentication model that is um, based on OAuth 2 and JSON web tokens, which are popular and ubiquitous now for these kinds of needs. And um, so, you know, this is all available after the talk, but uh, just the very briefly what happens, and we'll show this in the, in the demo too, is that like most APIs, you can retrieve an API key um, with that functionality is built into Iris, which is sort of the user portal at NERSC, if you're not familiar with that. You can create a refresh JWT token. <clears throat> Their JSON web tokens um, are, uh, if you've never seen one, it's an opaque string like you'd expect with an API key. So you can log into Iris and create one of those, and it has a certain long lifetime associated with it and a certain um, uh, scope or permission associated with it. And then the mode of access is you would store that in the workflow manager as a credential. And the, so your workflow manager or script or whatever system, what have you. And then that refresh token that you obtain is used by the script to obtain an access token that has a shorter lifetime. And so with the access token, uh, you can actually call to the API and, and make requests. So the refresh token is kind of the long lasting um, um, scoped credential. The access token is sort of the workhorse that you use on an everyday basis. Okay, so, um, so just to kind of roll up a little bit of what I've, what I've talked about. Um, you know, the vision of the API is really to provide uh, an automated means for interacting with NERSC. So between the, the different endpoints that we've prototyped and an authentication model where uh, that kind of fits modern standards and can make use of common libraries that are out there. What we're really trying to do is just ease access to some of the most common operations uh, in an automated way. And so we sort of put together this uh, comparison of you know, what life is like before the Super Facility API and what we hope to make it like after. So as you can see here, a lot of operations are manual, you know, reading a web page and making notes on a calendar as to when some workflows can run and blackout dates to avoid 
for testing things over SSH or writing scripts around SSH and SBatch <clears throat> and uh, you know, jumping through hoops in, for the way you would normally like to code up this, these kinds of uh, these kinds of routines. Uh, and then in general too, just no good mechanism for um, chaining jobs together or really having a good like heuristically designed workflow without an API that's natively callable. So we really hope to just make this kind of thing simpler for people. And can you next slide, please? <clears throat> so this is sort of the value proposition, uh, taking all of this into, uh, taking all this together. Our vision, again, you know, the nurse becomes essentially machine readable for these projects where automation is is uh, not not optional anymore it's really required at this scale um, nurse users to more easily create user interfaces portals uh, even just scripting and um, and in some cases too I mean allow integration with uh, native controller analysis software uh, through modern API standards <clears throat> uh, so you know for for established projects uh, that have every that have everything already working pretty seamlessly with some of the legacy methods you know this provides a, a nice refactor target uh, so if there's an opportunity to change some of the coding here's a cleaner way to do it and uh, we're not necessarily taking away some of those legacy uh, capabilities but Here's an opportunity to simplify code down the road. And then for new projects, it makes a much easier on-ramp. And then like I've mentioned, um, we, what we want to try to do too is help the software developers uh, end up with cleaner code that you like better. So fitting design patterns rather than fighting them. Shared libraries, API calls and modern standards, and uh, modern authentication and security models. Uh, next slide. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Bjorn to talk through some of our uh, science use cases, and then we'll get into the demo. Right. Uh, thanks, Corey. Yeah, so we are um, covering two uh, use cases here, though there are uh, a lot more within the Simplicity framework. So one that I'm uh, particularly involved is uh, light sources. Uh, ap apologies that LCS is not on the map over here. But the, the general story is that um, either from the nature of the light sources or the upgrades that are coming. They're basically taking more and more um, correlated data. So they have to invest in uh, detectors that increase the uh, overall data rate because they um, uh, are area detectors or they um, measure at higher frame rates. And that uh, leads to like a very high data volume and the computation required to analyze the data has has become increasingly demanding to do uh, on site. So looking for an ASCA collaboration. So the, the basic um, thing with EOD um, facility is that the workflow isn't, doesn't look too complex at first. So basically means that you have to get the data where the uh, compute facility is. You have to do the running analysis and you want to get the results and ideally the data uh, back. But what makes it um, challenging is that this is not, this isn't the, the, the workflow is not a traditionally good fit for the HPC system where you queue your jobs and you run your computation when the scheduler determines this. So the, the facilities really don't really want to um, wait in queues. Um, this also relates to the fact that they, um, that the work at uh, light sources is also exploratory, which means that your current analysis will inform um, your, uh, the, your experiments or what kind of steps you're doing next. And then, of course, uh, they don't want to um, be surprised that you know, NERSC is unavailable and they don't want to have easy access to, 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 um, to, to see if the compute resources is available when they're doing the experiments. And if it's not, um, they also want to be able to uh, move to a separate, um, uh, to a different compute facility. So they don't want to have, you know, NERSC as the exclusive um, 
um, processor of the data, or maybe a primary, but not necessarily exclusive, and they want to move to a different HPC facility or other resources. So they want it, the nurse should be available in their workflow really as an accelerator. And there's also other aspects that come with uh, uh, like those workflows, for example, they want to store data, so they want to have like a data hub where they can share it out for other people. Then there's um, a whole larger user base that they want to enable. They want to enable to do computing at NERSE. So if you see, like, then I think LS is 2,000 users a year. So that's like a whole um, a whole lot of new users that need to be uh, taken care of in the in this uh, frameworks and um, they also want the data to move in and out pretty quickly. I think this is already uh, pretty well established with ESNet and Science Team Z, but yeah, so all these kind of um, uh, aspects tied together in, um, in the requirements uh, for, for EOD workflows at HPC facilities. Yeah, next time. Yeah, so here I kind of pointed out where I see, you know, where uh, in, the, in the various steps, um, the, such a workflow would touch different aspects of the super facility API. So the first one would be that they need to plan ahead um, if, the, if the computing resource will be valuable for the experiment. For example, they would touch the uh, health API and see if there's, if there's any downtime and they may want to make a compute reservation so they know they have dedicated resources during the experiment. Then they want to uh, push the data to NERSC when the experiment is live and they want to run um, uh, you know the jobs you know, cause asynchronous with data so that's you know submit some the jobs API or check if your reservations up and maybe have make some um, you know um, correlating um, work so that or that you know one step depends on the other and then um, yeah they also want to get you know feedback from the uh, from the work they're doing, so they might want to transfer something out while it's still running, or they want, want to do arbitrary commands. And um, yeah, once you are done with everything, uh, you need to store it somewhere and you need to distribute the data and you send it out to collaborators. All these um, points again touch the transfer and the file API. And then there's a lot of other things within the super facility framework, like um, hosting services and spin, and so that's also important. So these all these kind of uh, things need to tie together to enable um, these workflows. Thanks. So the just to show another um, um, science engagement, so we're not only targeted for like a specific uh, user base. So the other thing is uh, we're the Rubin Observatory Dark Energy Science Collaboration, which is like a 900 uh, member strong collaboration. They have uh, the building observatory in in Chile, and they're basically mapping. Uh, the sky every uh, every few nights, and they use the data um, and they run a, a run a number of probes on the data to basically figure out um, you know to be better me measure you know fundamental cosmological constants and um, so the the idea is that if you have a that they don't only want to you know look at the data, but they also want to say you know they want to run simulations to better understand the instrument or the physics. They want to um, combine it with data that's not not only from that uh, um, uh, observatory, and uh, yeah, and they want to also have like a sharing platform. So if you have the the, the facility external to the the place where the data is, is is kept in the first place, it enables you to do um, all these. Um, all these combined work. Right. So, um, just to show you how how similar the uh, uh, dark energy science collaboration workflow is to what um, the light source is doing, it's the same in the same in the same way. They have to figure out um, if they want to do if they want to run the compute campaigns or the the jobs. Need to figure out. Um, if NERSC is up and if they can actually uh, if they can actually do their work, and um, then there's I think uh, within the supernova project they want to basically uh, measure all these um, these alerts that are getting transferred to NERSC and figure out if they want to um, do more comprehensive analysis based on the alerts. 
So they need to have some kind of automated um, uh, management for that and job submission. So they need to transfer the data in from the central um, storage location and then they have to um, submit the right compute jobs on top of that. And because it's a very large collaboration, they also want to, you know, um, stay ahead of all these uh, processes and services. So they want to have like um, all these checking and control um, of user quarters in, in addition. I think it's the worst time now. Okay, hi. Uh, so we're, we'll be uh, running, showing you this video um, that demonstrates the API's capabilities. We were going to do it live, but because of the Cori maintenance, um, that's not possible, so we taped it. So I hope this works. I've never done this before. So this is a, a, a sort of a demo workflow that, is, uh, that calls the API and demonstrate some of its features. Um, so the first thing that we do is we load our API libraries, and this is really just some Python code that does HTTP get and post. It's not anything special. In order to authenticate with the API, we need a JWT. So to get a JWT, we're going to jump over to Iris and get one. So this is the Iris UI. It's a new section in the Iris uh, interface called the uh, Super Facility API Jots. We got a little bit cut off, sorry. So if you click New Jot, you get a dialog where you can fill out some details of how you want to use this token. The more restrictions you add, the longer lifetime your Jot can have. And if you click Create Jot, it will go over to the Super Facility API site where you may be authenticated again and will return with this encrypted text. Um, and that's your job. You can give it a comment or a name so you know what it's used for. And when you save it, it saves it in your browser. So it doesn't actually save it in the database in Iris. So there it is. And then you can copy it um, to your clipboard. So going back to the demo, in the notebook, we paste in the encrypted string. And so now it's a global variable in the uh, so the first API we're calling here is the health API, specifically Cori, and it returns that Cori is active. With every API call, the job is sent along. So next, we are, we can see the, the planned outage. This was recorded yesterday, so there's the outage for today. So here, um, we're using the uh, command API. So this is similar to the new uh, command API. Uh, to create, to check the uh, current working directory. It takes a while to run and returns my default directory. So next we're going to create a job script of what we want to run and then use the command API to write that to says that it's okay, there's no errors. So you can use the uh, file listing API, it's like an ls command essentially, to um, make sure that it's there, there it is. And then we're going to use the q command or the q API to submit the job to the to, um, s -manage. So if this succeeds, it should come back with a job ID. And there's the job ID. Um, so here, uh, we're calling the Q API to see how the job is doing. Um, this is also taken from the new um, API. And there's a, a bunch of flags that you can set on it. We'll show you later by the documentation as you can see now. But you can, tell, you can see in the output that the job is now running. It's running on the real-time queue, so it, it runs relatively quickly, but I'm still going to fast forward a little bit because it takes a couple minutes that we don't have to sit here. Call that again. 
And now you can tell that the job is completed. So when the job is completed, um, we can, um, you know, cat the um, output file to see what the results were. There's the output. And then in the next step, um, we're going to extract the data file from the output. Um, this step is not using the Super Facility API, but it could. So there's our data file. So here we're going to, because we're in, in the Jupyter Notebook, we'll, we can display some visualizations about it. So we'll load the visualization library and take some pictures. So that's, that's a basic um, workflow that you can do today using the Super Facility API. Um, and as far as, the, there are a few people acknowledged at the end, but I, I'd like to also add uh, uh, Shreyas for helping out with the new questions. Uh, Shane worked with me on the SSH proxy chart integration, and Mark Day was very helpful with the uh, shibboleth issues. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we have documentation. The documentation actually comes from uh, Swagger annotations in the source code. So, so it should always be up to date. Uh, and it's also dynamic and interactive. So you can, if you go to this URL, um, you can try all the API calls. Um, some of them have not, are not implemented. So callbacks are not going to do much and reservations don't work. But all the others, you should be able to interact with. Um, uh, it is uh, driven by the underlying code, as I said, and uh, the URL for the documentation is the same URL that you're submitting your API calls to. And that's all I had. I'm going to hand it back to Corey. Yeah, so I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. And, uh, and discussion. I see there's some um, chat here about sharing the uh, sharing this notebook. Um, so we we do recognize it's a little bit of an irony to to give a whole lead into the talk about how uh, unattended operation and not having a human in the loop is uh, is a kind of the driving impetus here. And then we just gave our demo in uh, in Jupiter. Uh, but you know, for anyone else who's in love with Jupiter, you know, it's it's really good as sort of a classroom or presentation tool. So imagine that same code logic running, you know, overnight or you know, while you're doing other things. Is the idea. Uh, so and then as far as timing too, so we. We do have prototypes of the API that are running. We're doing an internal review of the system at NERSC and making some final, um, final tweaks to the authentication model to make sure that it sort of fits well with um, other libraries that are available so it's easy to develop against. So, um, <clears throat> so we don't have it rolled out just yet, but we're working on those final internal reviews and putting together our rollout plans where people could actually try it out. So just, it's just uh, in internal testing right now. And let's see, I see there's some questions popping up on the chat. I think we should be able to share the notebook. Um, like I said in the chat, it's, it's a pretty thin, wrapper um, and most of that block at the top that just divide, defines some um, kind of convenience uh, uh, functions for the for the call to take place and not obscure the notebook too much um, <clears throat> but yeah a illustrative example Uh, Gabor, do you want to say anything about Jan's question about the uh, Cori GPU cluster? So um, I think Im implicit in the question there 
uh, you know, can, could we use it against Cori GPU is um, maybe whether there's anything specific to particular queues or the shape yeah. versus. Yeah, no, it should work fine against the GPU cluster also. There, it, it just, it basically takes the place of SSH. So anything you would do, you know, with SSH, you can do with this. Yeah, which is a perfect segue into the latest question that just popped in there. Uh, what's the benefit of using this API instead of the regular SSH session? Uh, so, yeah, uh, probably a little bit of subjectivity in the answer there, and I'll, I'll let others chime in. But uh, one of the big things, I think, is from a security standpoint, uh, an SSH uh, certificate or an SSH uh, key pair is a pretty powerful tool uh, that's designed for general purpose. And so uh, accordingly, it, it's more of a security, um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a problem, but it's a security risk um, <clears throat> to have a long-lived SSH credentials because there's no way to scope what they can do. They're, they're intended to be general purpose. And so one of the reasons that we moved to a different kind of authentication um, substructure uh, and held it in, in, um, in consistent with OAuth2 methodology is that the JOT, the JSON web token, provides a way to actually indicate what the scope of the token is. And so, and you see this uh, on, on other systems too. Like a, one of the examples that we kind of discussed in this was uh, with GitHub. So you can create API tokens with GitHub, but if you reduce the privilege that the, the API token has, making it read only, so you can't make any actual you know, code changes or do commits with that token, then it can last much longer because its security profile is sort of slimmed down. And so that's what we're actually prototyping into the access control model for the API is to let you choose the kind of refresh token you want and then set the lifetime on that accordingly. And some of the things, some of the ways that the tokens are scoped, uh, for example, is you'd be able to specify a source IP range. So that, so that the API endpoint actually knows to not honor that token if it falls outside of the IP range. So that protects you, that protects NERSC, but that also enables us to put a longer lifetime on the token. And that's something that would be very difficult to do uh, in any kind of standard way with the uh, SSH protocol. So there's a lot to, to that, but that's the idea. <laughs> And probably like five more questions came in while I was going off on all that. Um, oh yeah, um, more details on the transfer API. Uh, Gabor, maybe I'll hand that over to you. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I would uh, encourage people to go to the URL, um, which is not visible, but maybe I can go back to that URL and then see what the transfer API does. It's essentially a wrapper over the the um, global scripts that uh, Lisa wrote that are available in Cori. So it, it lets you initiate the transfer um, using Globus, and then the other call, I believe, lets you check on the status of the transfer. And then a follow-up to the SSH. Does that mean that SSH access is going away at some point? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think it's, will bash go away? Probably not, um, but I would say, I would kind of turn the question around, I think, and say, don't you kind of want it to go away for a lot of the places where it's used if there's something simpler and better? So I think our view is that <clears throat> there are situations where SSH is the tool you need, and there are situations where SSH is the only tool you have and some alternative would be better. That's the gap that we're trying to fill with the API. So if you're coding something up, then um, you know making it work against uh, an API that kind of fits modern conventions, we hope is easier. 
for, for people to use. I don't know, does anyone else want to um, chime in on, on that as far as SSH and, um, and, and you know, the bright future? Yeah, okay, Rollin is uh, teasing some bets there. Fortran will go away before SSH in the chat. Let's see, um, question from uh, Dylan about what code is handling uh, the refresh token and the access token and that, that whole traffic. So, so I know Gabor has been kind of looking into these implementations in a little bit more detail. Do you want to say a little bit more about how you see that being handled? Yeah, so in the demo, uh, there is only one job. There, there is no refresh and access token. There's only an access and access token. Um, but in, in the future, we will, you know, we're heading towards having uh, two of these tokens and using them according to the OAuth 2 specification. But it, in the current version, they don't exist yet. Yeah, so we're, we're cheating a little bit, um, but I mean, what, uh, what would be useful to you with that, Dylan, just in terms, I'm thinking in terms of our rollout and, you know, what kind of documentation or resources that we provide, I mean, a pointer to some libraries or something like that. Yeah, I mean, examples of, example usage once of whatever implementation you have is helpful. Yeah. Um, I, my, my OAuth 2 experience is pretty meager, uh, but uh, I learned by example is kind of why I asked that question. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so I think that's a useful takeaway. A picture is worth a thousand words uh, in terms of documentation. And so one nice example you can work from. <laughs> Okay, I see a question from Hardy. Um, okay, are there plans to build a higher level SDK on top? Uh, on top of the API, you know, something similar to Python Globus SDK, um, which provides code wrapping to lower level web functionality. You can provide default functionality like submit. It's, it's an interesting idea. Um, so I know we, we have had some discussion about you know, is there a broader set of libraries that we would provide as a part of this in, uh, pr to provide and, and maintain? Um, I, I think I'd probably defer to like Warren Bjorn on this uh, to kind of give what some of the considerations are. Um, although I, I would say um, <clears throat> it's, one thing that we're committing to here is to provide some lifecycle support, backwards compatibility for the for the design of the API. As you see the version number on the API right there, a big shiny V1. And so we we do know that maintaining um, stability there is is critical. And we also recognize we can more easily do that if we kind of draw a line of demarcation at the API and its contract uh, versus if we extend into, you know, a provided SDK. So I think at least I can say our focus now uh, because of that is to focus on the, on the API and stability there and clarity in terms of, you know, how the endpoints act with the, with the Swagger documentation. Uh, other folks, uh, opinions on SDK? I, I, I would say that uh, maintaining, you know, language-based SDKs might be too much of a lift for the amount of staff that we have, but not impossible. But maybe what I could imagine is a, maybe a community-supported open source version somewhere out on the web that we would contribute to, but not be on the hook to maintain. We will watch for a, uh, a GitHub repo for a NERSC user group managed 
SDK, Hari. Uh, let's see what else. One of the slides mentioned no queuing. Um, let's see. I think that was in the use cases. Um, so um, let's see, I'm trying to, if you could put in the chat a little bit more, maybe expand on that question a little bit. And then is there an API for getting the jot from Iris? Okay, uh, well, there's a long answer to this one, um, <clears throat> but maybe I'll just kind of give a hint at it and we could talk later. Um, so the other initiative that this dovetails with is support for federated identity at NERSC, so um, federated authentication. So right now, uh, when you log into Iris, you're using the NERSC login page, essentially. It's using SAML. And we are working on, also as part of the super facility sort of umbrella of projects, the ability to support federated authentication uh, via a set of other identity providers, uh, a home institution. So <clears throat> if you use other distributed systems where you essentially choose your login page, that's the kind of functionality that we want to introduce as part of um, our federated identity initiative. So uh, those authentication mechanisms are all built with web protocols in mind and, uh, and human interaction in mind. So the strategy in order to be compatible with that is number one, it's the, be, the refresh token to be delivered via a human interface like Iris, but to sort of compensate for that, um, we have these capabilities to scope the refresh jot so that it can have a long life. So the kind of pattern that we see evolving is, yes, you log in as a, as a human or um, someone else on the project, you know, a, a co-PI or a postdoc or something like that can log in, um, get these refresh tokens every, however long, every few months or something like that, fetch one down, stick it in the workflow manager, and you're good to go for you know, the lifetime of the token. Uh, so that's, uh, that's sort of the, the strategy there in order to help maintain things like federated authentication as well as multi-factor authentication, which helps our security, um, our security surface as well. These are good questions. I'm curious if uh, if there's anyone who's you know seen the talk here and is thinking about well uh, something that's missing you know like my workflow does something else and I don't see anything in here native to handle that. We we'd be really interested to know what kind of functionality we should be thinking about for future iterations. Uh, and then, okay, Harry had a follow-up question there about logs or metrics that are captured in the API. Uh, I'll let you take that one, Gabor, since I know you've probably instrumented uh, some of this at this point. Um, sorry, I'm just reading the question. Logs or metrics. Um, yeah, so currently the, the these metrics are internal um, to us and, and um, Honestly, I, I haven't yet thought about how to expose that to the end user, but it should be doable um, as long as we log everything with the user or, or the the identity who created the action, then you should be able to get that back. So I, I think that's a great suggestion for new feature. Yeah. Oh, and then some feedback below. Um, uh, Peter, I, you're probably speaking for a lot of people. I'll need to use it a little bit more before I, uh, before I know what's missing. Fair enough. Okay. 
Okay. All right, it sounds like it's kind of quieting down and we're almost to the top of the hour. Uh, okay, uh, is there any way to get some help with setting this up for specific use cases? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think, so as we, as we start to, I don't have an answer for you <laughs> at the ready, um, but as we start to roll this out, uh, we would expect to take questions via the normal channels. Um, and so I think what will probably happen initially is some of those questions um, will either feed into our process to enhance the documentation, or if there are actual problems or, or bugs or oversight uh, in some of the, how the functionality works, then uh, questions like that could get dispatched into my group uh, for, you know, people like the board to look at or some of the other folks in the super facility project. So, um, yeah, we do intend to, you know, provide some level of support for working against this because we also want to hear the feedback uh, as far as, you know, whether things are, are working well or whether there are problems. Oh, Heather, we don't quite have a rollout date yet because we're doing some internal review, but uh, I would expect we should be able to make some of these endpoints available like over the summer. Uh, there, the one particular endpoint that that is uh, maybe useful to folks even now that doesn't require authentication, so it's um, less of an issue to make public is the health API. Uh, which you can you can tell the status of individual resources or the center and aggregate and um, and also see scheduled maintenance uh, ahead of ahead of um, when it's currently happening. <clears throat> uh, so that may be the one that we release first uh, and then roll in other releases later for functions that require authentication. So we're hoping for the for the summer. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate all the questions and I wanna thank the, the presenters again and um, for everyone who's helped in developing this. And uh, so yeah, Debbie, I'll hand it back over to you. All right. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Um, so I've just put the link to the web page uh, in the chat window here. Uh, the recording of this will be um, up uh, on that web page in a couple of hours, and so will the slides. Um, so uh, you can um, watch this again there if you want. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>